Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Welcome to my regular Sunday chat. Um, a bit of all sorts today. Um, I'm going to finish off the saga of the water. <laughs> RO units, placement, freezing cold outside, lots of carrying and stuff. Problem solved. Coming soon. Um, we will have a look at some new blooms which we've got um, and the associated orchids. I'll have a chat about yesterday's Orchid Society meeting um, and how that actually went because it was a first for me being on a Brains Trust panel, so a quick chat about that. And then I'll tell you about an event that's coming up that in the past I've met quite a few YouTubers at because it's, it's an annual prestigious Orchid show. Well, it's not where it used to be, it's in a new place. And for some that's a bonus and for others it's going to be a right pain because um, the show used to be in central London but not anymore. More about that in a minute. So uh, let's get going with today's Sunday chat. Right, as I said yesterday, um, this is not ideal. Uh, it's not ideal for quite a few reasons. Lack of pressure, a hell of a walk to get round here, and when that van der bucket's full of water, I can't carry it that far. I'd have to do it in, you know, picking it up, putting it down, wait a bit, it's just too heavy. And bending down and picking it up and putting it down again is not ideal stuff for back that can be a bit iffy sometimes. So uh, we have a solution coming up now. Okay, so on this type of tap you can get a gadget that sort of clips on the top and squeezes onto there. Um, a lot of the write-ups emphasize the fact that it's very rarely watertight and you get jets of water shooting out all up your wall or all over your floor. But what I've discovered is that this thing here comes unscrewed, although it's very tight. Oh, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to get it out. And that thread on there is a standard thread. And if we look at the pop-up, that's what you can get instead. Now that's metal, and it's got a proper hose lock attachment to it which is what's on the end of my RO unit. So I'll be able to collect, connect the RO unit up to this tap and I do believe there's more than enough pressure on that tap to run the RO unit. And once I get the um, different um, restrictor valve that will allow more water through as good water. It won't be as good quality as it was before, but it will run a lot faster, produce the water I want a lot quicker. The TDS will be higher, as yet unknown, but it's probably only going to be somewhere between 20 and 30, and I'm quite happy with that. Um, and um, in addition to that, because more will come out of the good end of the RO unit, a lot less comes out of the waste end. And the waste end can go straight down there or I can collect it if I choose to. So that's the idea is to replace this with a new unit and um, RO unit then becomes an indoor function so it's not weather dependent I don't have to go out in the rain and um, <laughs> there's another good reason for that at the moment I can't use the conservatory door because it, it, it doesn't close properly and at the moment I've sort of jammed it shut and that's how I want it to stay until the good weather comes where it won't matter so much and I can get a man in to fix it. But from here to get to where the RO unit would be, which is just outside this window, I've got to go right round and out the front door, through the carport, down the alleyway and come out here. And the last thing I really want to do is carry a full container of water that far. So much better if it's all indoors. Okay, let's have a look at some um, new blooms. I've only got a couple and um, they're not going to be very easy to show in some cases. 
Um, first of all, one of my um, oh, larger Restrepia plants. And this is a species, um, Falkenbergii, I believe. And the blooms on this are small, but they're very, very colourful. And at the moment, it's having a bit of a flurry. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I mean, this is um, one of not obviously it's a species so it's not one of Burnham's but it's one that Burnham's sell and I've always got available in various sizes um, but not very often as big as this um, this is actually quite a quite a large plant I've had it some time and with Restrepias you do get um, keikis so on the end of a leaf where the flowers come from sometimes you get a new growth and it will produce roots and it can be taken off and grown on as a separate plant. But um, this is one of the ones that, um, although it's nice to have such a large plant, they don't go to shows very well. Not that I grow plants for shows, but um, it's nice to be able to take them when they're at their best. It's difficult to get one of these at their best because they flower intermittently. The only way I can think you could do it is to keep it in Say, say keep it in deep, deep shade for six to nine months and get it used to low light levels where it probably wouldn't bloom and then bring it out into much brighter light and see if it will trigger a mass blooming. Um, you don't see them very often with a mass of blooms because it's difficult to achieve. They just bloom on and off all the time, continuously. So, you know, this one has virtually always got blooms on. But that's one of the ones I will probably split up. Um, if I'm showing Restrepias, um, because I can't hold these blooms absolutely rigidly still <laughs> and they're relatively small, I'll put pop-ups so that you can see what the blooms actually look like. And then there's another one, uh, which has got some blooms on. And this is um, not so small. This is one of the um, Eric Young Foundation ones, how do you say? Um, and these blooms, as Restrepias go, are quite large. Um, but nonetheless, this plant's not looking very good. This one doesn't seem to like the slightly brighter light it's been getting because the leaves are a bit pale. Um, some of the old leaves, I've left them on temporarily. They will get trimmed off eventually. And to tidy up a Restrepia, you've got to take all these off. Now, these are the old bloom spikes because many Restrepias, not all, will bloom many times from the same growth and the blooms come out from the back of the leaf. Like here. Yeah, they come out from the back of the leaf. And when the blooms drop off, um, the little spindly bit remains and it can make the plant look really untidy. But a quick trim with a pair of scissors to take those off and any dead leaves and it tidies them up marvellously. It doesn't take long. But um, yeah, this one is um, this would be difficult to get hold of as it, as it came out of the Eric Young Foundation and they don't, being a foundation, they don't, under normal circumstances, sell their plants. So trying to get plants out of there is rather difficult and this came off a friend who um, is, uh, well, has access, let's put it that way. <laughs> I think it was a dark night and he had a truck with the doors open next to one of the windows or something and I am joking. Anyway, so that's a nice one. Um, that's, that's it with the Restrepias. As I say, they come and go. Um, literally, they, they come and go. I, I have got a few species, um, as many species as hybrids. And then we've got my tatty looking um, Mazda Valia that's got a bloom on. This is my worst plant, and yet it's the one that blooms most often. Um, very attractive bloom. Um, no name, just hybrid. <laughs> its name on the label is Mastavalia Hybrid Yellow Stroke Cream because basically that's to differentiate it from the others that I've got that are mainly orange or orange with stripes or something like that. But um, it is a problem if you buy lots and lots of Mastavalia hybrids that have just got no ID, it's difficult remembering which one's which. So uh, as I said, I, I just put the colours or a slight description on the tag just to remember which one's which. which. Single bloom, um, although it's a tatty looking plant, it is gonna grow on now because it's, it's managed to get itself a root system 
and um, there's new roots coming all the time and new growths coming all the time so it will improve and eventually some of these really old marked leaves can be cut off and it might look a nice plant then but um, it certainly doesn't look a nice plant at the moment but it's actually growing okay oh, not bad root system there not bad so there's that one um, and then the next one comes after a coffee or a little coffee And the last of the twinkles is open, which is the yellow one. I've been waiting for this one. <laughs> it was a bit behind the others. Um, but it's um, as yellow twinkles go, this is a, a good version because it's quite a deep yellow. I've seen quite a few people's yellow twinkles that are pale. Now this one's a good deep colour. Um, tiny blooms, um, but you know, that, that's twinkles for you. A good well-grown twinkle will be just a mass of blooms this time of year or the, my twinkles are all late this year by a month. They're that much later than normal, if not more, quite honestly. Um, reason probably a bad spring when their growth would have started pushing on and we didn't get the weather last year. It was very cold so I wouldn't have had my daytime temperatures. Um, I don't think we had very good weather at all at the start of the growing season. So they were delayed getting going, which means they're delayed maturing, obviously. So, uh, yeah, so that's the last of the twinkles. I've now got blooms open on every single one. So at some point we ought to get some tags done, didn't we? So that we know which one's which. But <laughs> I know it's a lazy way around it. I know which one's which now because I have them on film. And all I've got to do really is run the camera along the twinkles now and film the blooms with the plant. And that benchmarks which one is which for future reference. But it, it gets messed up when things get remounted or taken off a mount, put in a pot or split or things like that. Then your reference is sort of gone. It'd be much easier to just put a tag on really, wouldn't it? <laughs> we'll get that done this time round. And then the other, only other new bloom we've got is, um, I won't say disappointing, but not quite what I was expecting given the plant. I'll show you what I mean when I can get it out. Now, what we're looking at here is a very large dendrobium with an impressive new cane. This is a good cane. And what we've got on the top there's some right piddly little blooms. I mean, they're attractive, don't get me wrong, but they're tiny. For the size of the plant, you know, as Phalaenopsis type dendrobiums go, these are little blooms. Um, not, let me see, I think this one round here is more fully open than one, the one we were looking at. It's not much bigger though. Um, yeah, so that's the colours we've got. It's quite honestly, that was what I was expecting. The green is. Oh, only just about green, given its duff name anyway. Um, but it is a, a yellowy green. I'd say it's nearer yellow than green, personally. But it's got a lovely colour in the lip, in the throat. Lovely sort of purplish red, um, sort of gradated between those two colours, I would say. So it's attractive, but when you look at the plant overall, it just looks wrong, because... <laughs> A plant that big should have had a bigger spike with more blooms on and the blooms, you know, you get the impression they should have been an awful lot bigger and they're not. But it's attractive. No sign of any fragrance but then it's a dull day and it is relatively early in the day today as well. So let's see if I can get that back without knocking everything over. There's trouble with big tall plants like that, especially when the pot starts to dry a bit which they do this time of year and dry things off in between watering this time of year. Um, right, the Spicesotic site um, on, as I logged into Facebook this morning, they have had an import. Um, so for anybody who uses them to buy, they've had a lot of plants in, including a lot of telumnias and catlias and there were some bulbophyllums and stuff but they've had an import so they are successfully importing plants in bulk which is what they've just done i personally would put out a word of warning if you're thinking of buying from them 
just remember what time of year it is and just remember how cold it is out there and your box sitting in a warehouse waiting for Postman Pat to pop it in his van and bring it round to you leave it on your doorstep or whatever yeah it's not really the weather for be for uh, posting orchids around at the moment not ideal and in addition to that you if you backtrack how did their plants get to them was there any iffiness involved there for instance that would have had to come into some place where customs would be involved if it was an import um, was that stored in a warm place before they even got to the uh, to the greenhouses where they're being housed? So worth worth a thought. This is not the best time of year in a, in and around the UK to be whizzing orchids around in boxes outside. But um, they did have some nice looking telumnias. I had a quick look this morning. I'm not getting any. I, I wouldn't buy tropical orchids this time of year. You know, it's just um, I'd gladly pick some up at a nursery bring them home in my car uh, so they don't get chilled but I'm not I personally wouldn't be posting up you know taking orchids via postman pack this time of year so that was that that was a good thing um, right the um, orchid society meeting <laughs> um, it's the first time these brains trusts happen at both of the orchid societies um, that I belong to um, I mean, at Bournemouth, they, they, they go a bit elaborate, shall we say, some would say overboard, but they have a, a panel of three or four people, and what they do is they hook up a webcam to the projector onto the big screen behind them, so that when the individuals on the panel are looking over their plant, the plant is projected up on the big screen for everybody to see. Otherwise, you don't get to see much. Well, quite honestly, the way we did it yesterday afternoon as a Zoom meeting worked better for me than the real thing. Because quite honestly, it was dependent on people getting their plant nice and close to their camera, turning it round to show the bits they wanted to show, and the host putting them up full screen which on a phone would still be that big, but for somebody like me with a big screen, I could see the plants we were looking at very nicely. So um, it actually worked reasonably well. It weren't, I wouldn't say there were lots of what I call problem plants. I mean, <laughs> certainly some of those things I've seen in the past. You don't analyse the problem, you just read the last rites and put it in the bin. You know, it's dead. <laughs> we're not into resurrections, so... Uh, but yeah, I, I, it went reasonably well. The only criticism I've got is against me. And I talked a little bit too long on some of the plants, which obviously restricts other people. So, um, But I think everybody that wanted to show plants did. And then we got away from problems with plants to just people running out into their greenhouses and coming back with armfuls of beautiful orchids in bloom. Um, you know, so more just a show and tell type sort of episode but it, it went on okay um, I forget how many people we had there but we uh, at the Wessex Society we don't get anywhere near as many as we would at a meeting nowhere near there's an awful lot of people just don't have the facilities to zoo, to zoo zoom they haven't got like a laptop or something like that so they can't I mean there's <laughs> I think there's about 10 people at Wessex I haven't even got an email address you know so that was that and then the other thing I wanted to tell you about is um, the RHS London Spring Show normally is held in central London. I think, I think the place is called Lawrence Halls, but it really is central London. It's near Victoria Station. And for people like us, it's a pain to get to because you spend ages sat on the coach looking at traffic and looking at sets of traffic lights on red. <laughs> you know, and buses, and it's just, the journey is just not nice. It's quite a long way on the motorway before we even get there. And um, I think they're messing around turning part of the motorway into a smart motorway anyway. Well, they might have finished that now. It's not, not very smart, actually. It's dumb what they're doing. But um, that's, that's uh, another subject. If, if you imagine it, I mean, obviously in the States, so I don't know how your... Um, super highways and motorways go. I know you've got six lanes in places, if not more. But on our motorways, where you can go fast, it's actually, you know, 
it's recommended on the grounds that it keeps the traffic moving, you have what we call a hard shoulder. This is a place to get your vehicle out of the flipping way if it breaks down or if you feel ill or something like that. You get out of the traffic and if you've got any sense you get out of your car and climb over the barrier just in case somebody falls asleep and plows into your vehicle. These smart motorways allow you to drive on the hard shoulder. And there are little pull-ins every now and again that are nowhere near frequent enough so that if you break down you can get out of the way. How's that going to work then? You don't normally choose where you break down, do you? Where you break down you pull in to the inside and you stop. And that, that, that's it, your car is not going to go anymore, it's broken down. And if that's not in one of those laybys, it's now in a traffic lane. That traffic is legally allowed to be doing 70 miles an hour. And it only needs a slight lapse in concentration or weather not too clever with heavy rain and you've got a very, very serious pileup. And this is supposed to be smart. Huh. <laughs> anyway, the government have decided to hold fire on them so they're not starting any more. Unfortunately, I think they're going to finish the ones they've started, which is like one near me. Um, Ask Lynn about it. Uh, Anyway, um, so a trip into London on a coach is a pain. It really is. It takes ages and there's nothing you can do apart, apart from I say, like look out the windows at a boring bit of motorway scenery, which is not very good on that one, and then you're stuck in traffic for ages. Um, but they've moved it. It's now not in central London. It's at Wisley Gardens, RHS Wisley. And that is outside of the M25, the orbital motorway around London. So it's outside of London. And it has reasonable road access. And for us, it's brilliant because we don't have to go into London anymore. It's a lot closer. Our journey will be a lot shorter. We're happy. But for people who used things like public transport trains or things like that to get down into central London, they've now got to get into central London and come out again. So it's not so good for them. But um, I think the transport link to Wisley is not bad. I don't know, I'm just saying that. Anyway, so the London show, which incorporates the Spring Fair. So you've got the Spring Fair, which is all bulbs and bedding plants and stuff, all that sort of thing, gardening type stuff. And the Orchid Show that normally took place in London is now at Wisley. And it's taking place in their brand new buildings, which is up on a hill overlooking the grounds, apparently, and is quite spectacular. And it's in there. Um, <laughs> trying to find an advert for it, um, you'll lose the will to live. RHS are hopeless at getting stuff organised. But at the end of the day, the show is on the 25th, 26th and 27th of March. So that's Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Um, if you're an RHS member, then you get into RHS Wisley free. But what I can't find out is if there's a charge to get into the Spring Fair and the Orchid Show. There always used to be in central London, sort of five or six pounds entry fee. Obviously we've had a couple of years when there haven't, hasn't been one for obvious reasons, but it's back up and running now. So I don't know whether there's an entry fee or not. Um, <laughs> but if, if you've come up from the Midlands or somewhere like that, the amount you've paid to get there, the entrance fee is just going to be like a cup of coffee in comparison. But um, our coach load of orchid loonies get in free because we're an affiliated society and once a year um, I'm allowed to take a group in free of charge and they've got back to me and confirmed that our free of charge includes the grounds, the glass houses, the shops, and the Spring Fair and the Orchid Show. So all the people have got to pay with our two societies is the coach fee. Um, and for that, you know, all they've got to do is get on and sit back and relax and get off at the venue. So, uh, and then get a ride home, hopefully. <laughs> right, so that event is um, for those who haven't been to an Orchid Show for a long time because there haven't been any. Um, that is a relatively big one. I can't say how big it's going to be because at the moment you can't find out who is going to exhibit there. That's what I said, the RHS are hopeless at advertising things. You've got a job to even find out this event even exists, let alone find out about it. But um, <clears throat> this used to have 
a lot of the European traders there when it was in central London and obviously that was prior to Brexit. So I haven't got a clue what traders are going to be there. Um, you know, the likes of Burnham's, Lawrence Hobbs, um, quite a few of the UK ones will be there um, with their displays and plants for sale. Um, and it's not a bad time of year to be buying orchids as well. You know, we'll be well into the growing season, the start at that particular time. So, um, so that's that event. Um, as far as events here are concerned, I've got one more of the um, project orchids to do. Um, that will get done either tomorrow or Tuesday. I want those out of the way. And then we have to start thinking about what we're going to do this year for project orchids. I don't think I'm going to do it as I have done for the last, I think, three years now um, and have a four-part saga that, that actually does updates every three months throughout the season. Um, they are quite popular, but only just. There's lots of people that watch them and leave comments, say that they really like the series. But if you look at the total number of views, they're not as high as perhaps you'd expect them to be. So although they appear to be popular with the comments, some people aren't watching them. So um, I need to rethink it. That's all I'm going to do. I will do something, but I need to rethink it and have a different attack, di different plan of attack. We're going to do something different this year, but in, this, in a similar vein. And I, that has yet to be decided. Ideas on a postcard. <laughs> Polite ones, please. <laughs> So yeah, so that's to think about basically, and um, I'm not really going to have a talk about orchids today apart from the subject of media comes up and I contrive my media to suit my watering habits. Now some people's watering habits are, are purely dictated by their lifestyle. Um, like working people, for instance, well, I can only water my orchids at the weekend, so they have to wait till the weekend, even if they're dry, because I can't do them in the week. Um, there is a downside and an upside to that. Um, <laughs> I've always said overwatering will kill a lot more plants than underwatering, and if your plants are getting dry by about Wednesday or Thursday, they're probably going to do better than if they're still wet on Saturday and you water them again because that's what will soggy, make the roots soggy and you lose your roots. But I choose a media that I hope, obviously once it beds itself in, because bark soaks up next to nothing when it's new, but it does eventually hold some moisture, try and gear up what's going to go in that pot, given the size of the pot and the size of the root system, choose the media that ought to dry out when that pot will next come round for watering rather than have lots of different watering schedules you see what i'm getting at you know so um like my cooler shadier ones masdevallias dracula singular and my restrepias plus my miltoniopsis that's a set now they don't get watered very often at all because they're in media that holds moisture they're not really supposed to dry out um, so their media was chosen to stay moist longer. That means that, for me, they don't need watering that often at all. You know, I can go, at this time of year, I'm going 11, 12 days between watering. And some of them I pick up and I think, no, no, you're not nearly dry yet, you're a bit, no, nope, you can wait. <laughs> and they wait again, so they don't, they're not getting much. But, um, you know, if I put them in a different type of media and they dried out quicker, those couple that I've just repotted would not fit in with that watering cycle. They'd dry out too soon and then they'd end up staying dry. That's not good. So I have to choose a media for a set. Um, mounts don't count. <laughs> They're a set on their own and come the warmer weather every two or three days, absolute minimum. And if it really... I don't believe I'm going to get hot here like I used to in the other place. We used to get hot weather outside where it didn't even cool down at night. The mounts really needed doing every day because they were drying. I don't believe I'm going to get that sort of heat ever again because the sun's not going to be up beating down. That grow room was facing southwest. It was in full sun for two thirds of the day. And in the summer, that's like 12 hours beating down sun, heavily shaded to help try and help keep it cool. 
Lots of fans on the go. Extractors, inlet, poor old Hurricane Hector on full blast all day long. I don't think I'm going to need all that this year. <laughs> the sun's not going to hit the, the grow room itself. So it'll be a different feel to the place this year. And um, okay, there are some plants that actually enjoy the heat, and I've got some of those. They're not going to probably do as well. But the majority, I think, are going to do quite a bit better because they get stressed in heat. So we, that remains to be seen. It's a little bit of an experiment, and in amongst it, there's a bit of, bit of gambling going on as to planning on what will happen without knowing. I've got no way of knowing if the sun is going to hit this place. If it does, I think it'll catch the end. In, in the midsummer, when the sun's at its highest, I think it will manage to get over the roof. Um, once it passes that huge oak tree, of course, so just there, there's a gap. And I think it might hit the end. But it won't hit any of the sides. It'll only hit the roof. So if I have to put some shade netting up, it'll just be a matter of draping some over that end. Maybe. Remains to be seen. So you can't plan for it. I've just got to wait and see what happens. You know, and see what happens as the, um, as the weather changes. Which it's still cold today. Not quite as cold as yesterday. Certainly not as cold as the day before. They had minus seven not far away from here. Um, and okay, I know there's, there's some people put in the comments, yeah, we had minus 30. Um, that's ridiculous. That's not where people should be living if it's minus 30 outside. That's not a place for humans to be. It's not right. <laughs> the only reason for being there is you can't stand people. <laughs> that's the place to be then, isn't it? Because there won't be many around. No, that, those sort of temperatures are not, they're not right. You know, think of the energy you're using trying to stay warm. It would be cheaper to just uproot and move south. That's what all the birds and the creatures do, don't they? It's a bit cold up here, we're off. Head south. And then when it starts getting a bit, you know, God, it's getting a bit flipping sticky around here, isn't it? Head north. Yeah. But we tend to root. We tend to put down these roots and they're artificial. It's often, if it's a employment thing, fair enough. If this is the only place you can be where that job exists, then you're stuck with it, aren't you? But uh, nowadays the mobility is available and most people can move around if they choose to. And um, I wouldn't like to live in a place where the average day temperature is 35 or 35 plus. That would be a bit too much for me. I'd put up with it, but I'd rather not. You know, so I, <laughs> in this heading south bit, not quite that far. <laughs> and it's the same, you know, with, with up north. You know, if, if, it's, if, if it's that sort of temperature outside, you're not going to want to put your nose outside the door, are you? You need about eight layers on to just go out and put the bin out. You know, it's, um, it's not where humans should be. But as long as we keep breeding and increasing our numbers, we're going to have to be in these places, you know, and try and survive. But, uh, Anyway, I'm surviving quite nicely here. <laughs> so far, so good. Um, one of the cats is still not settled. Um, he's, just, he's just not right. He's just, he still yowls for no apparent reason. He just sits on the stairs and looks around and yowls. He's not quite right. But all I can do is give it time, you know. <laughs> you can't explain anything to a cat, can you? You can't even ask it to do something nicely. It'll just look at you and say, no, not doing that. <laughs> Very independent creatures. Anyway, so just a, a, a chitty chat chat today. Not really an orchids thing. And um, I could do with some suggestions for subjects, specific actual subjects on orchids. Um, one thing I probably will do next week is re-look at the Catleas. Although, quite honestly, from the time we looked at them last time, plus the Project Orchids looked at some of them, there isn't really anything changed. There's nothing really to look at. I don't know what set of orchids would be a, you know, a good thing to sort of revisit, but um, we'll sort something out. But, uh, as I said, things are coming into growth in places, slowly but surely, but they're early signs. Nothing's going mad yet. We, got, we, need, we need the end of February and into March before things start really pushing on. And that's the day length will do that. Um, I do have control of the heat temperature in here. Um, what I do is at night I take my thermostat down to 
um, 16, which means it averages 15 through the night. And then during the day, I come and whack that up to 18, which means it averages sort of 17 to 18. Sometimes it gets a bit higher because I'm drawing heat out of the house. Um, but that's the only differential I can get now without, you know, without spending an absolute fortune on getting the temperatures up. I mean, I would like my daytime temperatures at 20 plus, 21, 22, that would be nice. With a nighttime of 15, I'd be happy with that through the winter, but I can't afford that. That is just too much heat. Especially now this place is so much bigger. Um, and I don't even know if this place is leaching heat. I mean, it is all double glazed and it is a modern framework. Um, and the gaps in the double glazing are large, so they are up to modern standards. The double glazing in here is far better quality and more insular than the double glazing in the house windows. Far better quality, uh, as I said, with a nice big gap as well. So. It shouldn't leach heat too much unless it's going out through the roof, but uh, difficult to tell. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that for today, as I say, just a chitty chat with some ideas and some events. And um, I'll see you next time. Thanks for dropping by.